Um, so uh, I wanted to give this presentation to help everybody maximize their success um, in this lambing and kidding season. Um, we're going to uh, please ask questions. Um, Rich and Ben are going to help with uh, getting me those questions as the presentation goes on. So feel free to ask. Um, there is a lot of information here. I try to uh, maximize what I can cover in about an hour. Um, so certainly not everything is going to be on here, but uh, let's see if we can't get started. So I'm actually going to start. Um, oh, come on. My computer is going to definitely, definitely be fine. Okay. So um, I'm going to start with uh, just pregnancy determination. Um, the reason I'm starting uh, seemingly way earlier than lambing and kidding season is because you really need to know, you know, which, which does and which ewes are pregnant um, so that you can take care of them appropriately uh, while they're pregnant. Um, so pregnant, pregnancy determination becomes important um, so that you can separate pregnant and non-pregnant females. You can feed them differently, okay? Um, and, uh, and keep track of them a little bit differently. Um, so a couple of methods for pregnancy determination in sheep and goats. Um, ultrasound is probably the easiest. Uh, of course, I'm probably a little bit biased. I do this all the time. It's just really easy for me to pop a probe on their abdomen and say pregnant or non-pregnant. And uh, the ultrasound can be done um, as early as 30 days. Um, if you want to count how many um, uh, lambs or kids they have, you have to wait for uh, 45 to 90 days um, to get an idea of, of that. Um, that's going to be important. We're going to talk a little bit about it later. Um, the, the number of fetuses is also going to affect um, some of the risk factors uh, they have for certain diseases. Um, and of course, it also affects how much, um, how much they, they should be fed. Some people like to do uh, uh, abdominal belotment, which just means you uh, push your fist into their abdomen and kind of jiggle it. And any fetus will bounce back and, and kind of bump your fist. Um, you have to be fairly practiced, uh, to do this and you can't do it until they're, uh, sorry, late, late term, uh, pregnancy. And then, um, a lot of people want to do hormone tests using either urine, blood or milk. Um, and that's certainly an option. Um, As a veterinarian, I feel like they have a lot of false positives and false negatives. Um, and that's why I think the ultrasound ultimately is easier because you just wham, put your, put your probe on the abdomen and you know if they're pregnant. Whereas the hormone tests, um, they can have some, some potential issues with that. Plus, you know, you're catching the sheep and goats anyway, drawing blood, et cetera. So um, I definitely, obviously I'm biased. Um, so come on. Once we um, have determined that they're pregnant, uh, we need to know how long their gestation is. Um, they're pretty similar, although uh, sheep are a little bit uh, shorter um, gestation length than goats at 145 days, um, but there's always gonna be a range of about 10 days. So six, six to 10 days um, earlier or later than that. So, but that's important because we wanna know roughly when they're, roughly when they're due. Um, ideally, we should be putting the rams and the bucks in for a uh, specific amount of time, uh, either 30 days to two months, depending on how many um, are in your herd. And then you can get a rough idea of when these guys are going to be due. All right. So as we're preparing for, for lambing and kidding, uh, we do want to take care of these girls um, and, and make sure we're feeding them proper nutrition. Uh, I can't get into a lot of nutritional details because everybody's situation is, is different. So um, sheep are different than goats. Um, whatever breed you have, whatever you're breeding them for. Um, someone here on here said they had a sheep dairy. I mean, all that nutrition is going to be completely different. Um, but you want to try to maintain your pregnant females 
um, between uh, a two and a half to a 3.0 body condition score. And we're gonna go over that a little bit, how to determine what that is. Um, and so that just means they're kind of middle of the road. They're not too fat, not too thin, um, because they're more likely to get um, some of these diseases, excuse me, some of these diseases around lambing and kidding if um, they're, they're too fat or too thin. All of our pregnant females um, need free access to mineral. And we want to try to reduce stressful events um, such as hoof trimming and shearing if possible, um, because stress can uh, lose their, lose their uh, lambs or kids. Um, if a ewe or a, um, a doe is pregnant with multiple lambs or kids, uh, we may need to adjust their food. Um, they might need access to more feed or more hay. Um, and that's another thing you might be able to do depending on your facilities. If you, if you know she has twins um, versus a singleton, you might be able to um, separate those uh, does and use out so that you can um, feed them uh, separately. So this is just some uh, basic diagrams of body condition scoring a sheep. Um, for sheep and goats, we body score them out of uh, five. So they can get a one, two, three, four, or five. Uh, one being the skinniest, um, this one at the top here, you can see the ribs. Um, you can see the bony prominence, prominences of their hips and their pelvic bones. Um, versus when they come to a two, we're less likely to see that. And then we get a nice kind of around, <laughs> around sheep all, all the way around with a body score of three. Now, obviously, if your uh, ewes haven't been sheared recently, this gets so. Uh, so I always encourage people to get their hands on that sheep and actually put your hand along the spine and you can really feel how, how um, prominent that spine is uh, and whether there's flesh kind of filling it in on either side. Um, you really got to put your hands on the sheep in order to be sure. Um, <laughs> these two pictures are um, body scores of four or five. They're both uh, too fat. For our use, um, they're obviously very rounded, um, and and body scores this heavy are really going to predispose you to a couple of our um, uh, diseases that we're going to talk about. So uh, we definitely want to try to aim for that um, that that two and a half to three right here at the bottom. Okay, um, and then this one is just uh, for goats. Not super great quality, sorry. But what I like about this picture is it shows on the right-hand side here um, the, the prominent uh, spine. Uh, so in a one and a two, we have a lot more um, uh, prominent spine. It's, it's kind of sharp at the top here. And then that muscle and the fat fills in along either side. So you can get your hands on these guys and do the same thing. Um, it's a little bit easier in sheep and goats um, to determine what we need. Um, so we want around a three for a goat as well. So, Doctor, are... I'd like to uh, interrupt. We have a question in the chat. Yep. Are the comments about the gestational care relevant to the whole period? Isn't nutrition more critical in the third trimester? And things like hoof trimming stress less problematic in early gestation? Yes, absolutely. I should have mentioned that. Definitely, the last trimester is going to be the most um, the most stressful. Uh, the most likely to lose lambs and kids. So yes, and um, usually with the first two trimesters, you can get away away with feeding them pretty much similar. Absolutely. All right, um, we do have another recommendation for gestational care. Um, I know we said that we wanted to reduce stress during that last trimester, but you do wanna try to get them vaccinated three to four weeks before they give birth. Uh, and the reason for this is that, you know, they're going to be in that last month before they lamb or kid, they're going to be developing colostrum. And we want that colostrum to be full of antibodies for um, diseases. And the main one that we see being an issue in sheep and goats is uh, clostridium perfringens type C and D and tetanus. So uh, we can actually um, prevent a lot of neonatal losses by making sure our animals are vaccinated three to four weeks before we before they give birth. Um, 
Okay, so on to some issues um, that can crop up during gestation, um, some of which uh, happen later um, or closer to uh, lambing or kid kidding. And again, these generally, at least the first two with vaginal prolapse and pregnancy toxemia are usually uh, a, a third trimester uh, issues. Um, abortions, when they lose their, their fetuses, that can happen anytime. Um, it just might be, we won't, we might not notice and unless it's later in gestation when they have a, a bigger fetus. So uh, we're going to talk about these diseases, what they look like, um, and a little bit about what we can do for them. Dr. Dutton, we had another question here regarding shearing. Yes. Uh, we have a person who has heard from vets and other shepherds that uh, shearing 60 to 30 days before lambing, weather permit permitting is wise. Is that true? Yes. So um, again, I like to minimize it when it's in that last month. So if you were to do it um, before, you know, 60 days before it would be ideal. Um, and the reason for that is uh, we can get a lot of that uh, wool <laughs> out of the way of the, uh, of the back end of that sheep, okay, where they tend to collect uh, fluids and discharge, um, and that could be an issue. The other issue we see with um, sheep having wool on when they're lambing is that um, if they have a big fluffy fleece and it's full of little dingleberries, okay, sometimes the lambs will nurse on that instead of the teats, and then we can end up having uh, mortality issues because they're basically nursing on manure, if that makes sense. Um, but we definitely, you know, within 30 days of lambing, we definitely don't want to be doing that. Does that make sense? Oh, thank you. All right, so let's talk about uh, vaginal prolapse. This is a, a pretty common issue um, that we see, particularly in overweight ewes. Um, the picture on the left here is a ewe with uh, vaginal prolapse. That's just what it looks like, this big pink um, fleshy piece uh, hanging out the back. Um, the degree of prolapse is going to um, uh, be variable. So this one's pretty significant. That's a pretty significant chunk of tissue coming out. Sometimes they'll be less, a lot smaller than that. Sometimes you'll see prolapse only when uh, the animal is laying down. So it's definitely important. Some of them uh, we don't necessarily need to fix unless they're a little bit bigger or they're out all the time. The longer this tissue stays out, uh, the longer it's going to, it's going to dry out. Um, it's going to get, um, it's going to get abraded. Okay. They're going to rub it up against things and, and basically uh, destroy that tissue. And then we're going to get infections um, and then probably lose the, the you. So um, depending on the size of um, a lot of uh, producers replace these on their own. Um, I would just say, you know, make sure you're really clean. You have to um, warm water, mild soap. I, I often have people use Dawn dish soap. Um, clean it up, rinse it off, and then replace it. Um, the issue is you got to keep it in there. <laughs> you got to keep it in there until they lamb or they kid. So we have a couple different methods of doing that. Um, on the right is a picture of um, a prolapse uh, retainer. It's a big piece of plastic. And this big yellow spoon part in the middle um, actually goes into the um, vaginal canal and holds that tissue in place. And then um, the two uh, wings on either side just go kind of around their thighs. Um, and then you make a harness out of that. So that's something that a lot of producers do on their own. Um, but I will mention that when ewes are overweight, this is, this is what happens. And, and not sure why, other than there's just a lot of fatty tissue in, in that vaginal canal, uh, more so than usual. And then um, when they uh, are heavily pregnant <laughs> and they lay down some of that tissue, there's just a lot of pressure on it. So it tends to come out. Um, here's an example of a goat with a prolapse retainer in place. So this big, um, the big tongue part of that is uh, placed into the vaginal canal to replace the prolapse. And then the wings are on either side. And then um, uh, a sort of harness 
around their abdomen to keep that in place. Um, ideally, it should be removed <laughs> when she's starting to uh, go into labor, um, but they will kid around or lamb around these. Um, so it's not the end of the world if you miss it, but um, just it should be removed. The other option that sometimes people like is a prolapse harness. Um, this picture on the right is a sheep that has uh, the prolapse harness in place. Um, so you can purchase these and they have a, um, an area for their tail and the um, anus and vulva to come through. And then um, it basically applies pressure to either side of the vulva. Um, and then there are several straps that wrap around their belly and around their neck um, that hold that in place. Um, so that's certainly an option. Um, I'm not sure that I don't think they can really kid or lamb through this prolapse harness. So I would have to, I would have you keep really close, uh, really close eye on your on your use uh, to make sure they're removed um, before we have uh, issues. Okay. So the next issue um, that's pretty common in sheep and goats um, before they lamb and kid is going to be pregnancy toxemia. Uh, pregnancy toxemia uh, often occurs in late gestation. It more often occurs in those carrying triplets or quads. I'm not saying it can't happen in singlets or twins, but um, triplets or quads have a higher risk. And so basically what happens is the fetus is growing really fast. Sorry, the fetuses. Um, they need more calories. Um, and the ewes and does sometimes can't eat enough to keep up with that caloric need. Um, and not only that, their uterus is gonna be really big, especially if they have triplets. And oftentimes they simply can't eat enough because their abdomen's already kind of full, if that makes sense. Um, pregnancy toxemia is life-threatening. Um, symptoms of it include lethargy, reduced appetite, uh, recumbency, uh, not keeping up with the herd or the flock, uh, neurologic dysfunction, so they might look like they're walking funny, they might look weak uh, when they do try to walk um, or have an inability to get up, um, and then ultimately can lead to coma and death. So um, if you suspect pregnancy toxemia, um, it's probably a good idea to have your veterinarian come out and evaluate um, and treat. Sometimes, depending on the severity of the condition, you can um, support them. Um, and sometimes, um, sometimes we have to do a C-section uh, because really those fetuses are um, kind of sucking a lot of energy and calories out of that sheep or goat. And so um, if they're severely affected, they're gonna need a C-section. So in general, pregnancy toxemia requires veterinary uh, intervention. Um, cause if it's now, if it's caught early, we can change their diet. We can supplement them with something called propylene glycol. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, propylene glycol is a liquid, um, and it basically is converted to, uh, propionate and then to glucose in ruminants. So, um, it's a glucose precursor. So, uh, the diet change might be a change to, um, a, a better quality hay. So for example, if they were all on first cutting, you could maybe change them to second cutting. You could maybe increase their grain portion of the diet. Um, the goal is to get more calories into them, um, smaller volumes. If they're caught later in the course of the disease, um, they require um, glucose or dextrose intravenously. Um, and then some of these guys, we can, if they're um, usually we're looking at, uh, within two weeks of a due date, uh, hopefully we can do a C-section and save both mom and kids. Um, so it would be ideal if we knew when they were due and sometimes that's a guessing game. Um, so that's why, <laughs> that's why kind of determining when our, uh, when we're getting pregnant and having them ultrasounded, um, can be very helpful, um, as well as having a short breeding season for these guys. Uh, Dr. Dutton, we had a, a question uh, about this specifically, wondering uh, about inducing labor in a U with toxemia, U, uh, inducing labor in a U with toxemia. You've sort of addressed that. Could you address that again, please? Yes. So 
it, you can induce labor in, in use with uh, toxemia. Again, it, de it really depends. Uh, it depends on the stage of pregnancy. Um, I probably shouldn't have written C-section here. I should have written inducing labor um, because they don't necessarily need a C-section, I guess. Um, so I'm not averse to that. It's just, if you want to have the best outcome, you got to know when they're due. Um, and the lambs and kids, if they're not within two weeks of the due date, they don't do really well. Um, but yes, that's definitely one way to help them through it. We had a follow-up question uh, after a C-section. Can the U birth vaginally the next season? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I mean, you would be amazed. So they, uh, that uterus shrinks up and looks normal. So in general, they, they do just fine um, next time. Okay. So the third kind of issue we see in um, during gestation for sheep and goats is abortion. And this just means the delivery of dead lambs or kids before their full term. So this picture on the right might be a little gruesome, but these are a couple of kids that were born early. So um, they're not quite to full term. They don't quite, they're not quite covered with hair. Um, so that means they, um, they're not stillborn. Um, stillborn lambs and kids um, come out fully formed and with hair and everything. Um, so this is, this is not bad. So abortion can be a, a big issue. Um, there's three main causes. They're all infectious. Um, toxoplasmosis, which is a protozoa, uh, enzootic abortion, which is caused by chlamydia abortus, a bacteria, and campylobacter J. juni. Um, the biggest issue with abortion is that these diseases are zoonotic. That means that you can get them and you don't want these. <laughs> you don't want these. So um, they can also cause herd outbreaks. So if you're suspecting that uh, these lambs or kids are being born before full term, if you're suspecting that they're, uh, the, the you or the doe is aborting, you really want to get your veterinarian involved so that we can do some testing to see what it is. If it's, a, if it's an outbreak, um, we can put the rest of the herd on antibiotics, for example, to help prevent future losses. Um, so it is important to um, save the fetus and the placenta, if you can, um, for, for testing. Um, and, then when you, oh, and then when you call your veterinarian, they will evaluate both. Um, usually we'll send in the fetus and the placenta to a lab that deals with it all the time. Um, but we'll also want to check the U to look or the doe for any signs of um, disease as well. Uh, uh, although many of them don't show, uh, even with these uh, different diseases, many of them don't show a lot of signs. So um, something that we definitely don't want to have. Dr. Dutton, we have a question specifically about Cache Valley virus. Uh, do you uh, have anybody in your area that has had issues with that in the last couple of years? Um, not to my knowledge, no. I'm not super familiar with Cache Valley fever. Um, I, we, I, not to my knowledge have we had it up here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the actual birth process. Um, Sheep and goat go, goats, while well, most of our mammals go through three stages of um, parturition, which is birth. Um, stage one is the preparation for parturition, basically the nesting phase, okay, when they're going to be uncomfortable and, and maybe not want to eat and drink, that kind of thing. Um, stage two is the actual um, giving birth, expulsion of the fetus. And then stage three is passing the placenta. So all three of these stages are important um, and you should probably know how long they take. So stage one is your longest stage. That can be anywhere from two to 12 hours. Um, and stage one ends when uh, the water breaks. So um, once the water breaks, we were entering into stage two. Um, stage two is your shortest stage. Um, it should be less than two hours for a sheep or a doe to pass their fetus. Now, if you have uh, triplets, 
or twins. Um, it can be an hour, but it can be up to an hour between those two, but generally um, two hours for the whole process, potentially. Um, stage three is passing the placenta. Um, Ideally, stage three should last no longer than six hours, so the placenta should be passed by then. Um, however, we don't really consider the placenta retained until it's been retained for um, 12 hours or more. Uh, so, okay. So once we get into stage two, which is when we're really gonna start, the, you or that dough is really gonna start pushing. Um, at that point in time, our fetus should have assumed a proper birth position, okay? So the pictures, the pictures on the right side of the screen, they're calves, but um, that's okay. Uh, the proper birthing position for lambs and kids is gonna be head first and front feet first, uh, both of which should be, or all three of which should be extended, okay? Um, that's how they should come out. Now, because lambs and kids are a bit smaller than calves, uh, we don't mind having re rear feet come out first. Um, and sometimes they will be born that way. So um, if, you're, if you're checking on your uh, lamb or your doe or your sheep and your, you and your doe, sorry, um, and you see, you know, you have back feet, that's okay. Um, they, that will actually come out just fine, or it should. Um, now, Dystocia means difficult birth, and it is fairly common, and the most common reason that we see it in sheep and goats is malpresentation. So instead of having this head diving and, and front legs extended position, we have something else, okay? And so I'll have that on the next page. Um, so something that you can do if you notice that you're... Um, you or your doe is in labor and she's not making progress, they should really be making progress within 30 minutes. Um, something should be happening. So if the water breaks and she's still kind of hanging there, she's having contractions, she's pushing a little bit, but nothing's happening, I would go ahead and get in there and see what's going on, um, which you can certainly do. Um, and when you go in uh, vaginally, you want to check to see if that fetus is uh, coming out the correct way. Please, 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 and I'll say it again, please wear gloves. <laughs> um, like I said, there's a lot of diseases that you can get, uh, not only with aborted fetuses, but even with um, fetuses that are to term. So please wear gloves. Um, use mild soap, such as Dawn dish soap and warm water. Um, I, I want you to clean around that vulva before with the soap and then rinse it off and then use your gloved hand to go in there and see if you can feel the fetus. Um, if you need, there's uh, obstetrical lubricant is readily av available, OB lube, um, and you want to try to palpate the fetus in the vaginal canal to determine positioning. So some other positions um, among many um, that can happen are, for example, we'll start on the left side of the screen, um, this calf has uh, the head, excuse me, the head is presented, but both feet, uh, front feet are folded back. Okay. Another uh, mispresentation here in the middle is um, it's the rear of the calf, but both hind legs are folded forward. So this animal is not going to come out. And then on the right side, um, we have an example of a head back um, or down in this case. We have the front feet extended, but the head is pushed down. Um, so these aren't going to come out. And so you can gently palpate vaginally. And if you feel two feet here and, and not the head, um, you've, you've got to, to bring that head up, um, et cetera. That is something that uh, a lot of farmers can do. You just want to be gentle. Um, but if you're not making progress, um, you really should call a veterinarian out to help you. Now this picture has them pulling a lamb, but they're not wearing gloves. So please don't read too much into that. <laughs> um, if you get in there and you can feel head and legs and everything seems to be coming and it's just not, it's just taking a little longer than you thought. I mean, feel free to pull that lamb out. You know, you're not gonna hurt it. Um, better to get it out there while you can. 
um, and get it and then get it breathing and drying off. Um, if you need to reposition the fetus, you can gently push the fetus back into the uterus a little bit um, and then, you know, pull up a head or legs. Um, it can be difficult, especially if you've never done it before. Um, just make sure that we use lots of lubricant. Um, a lot of times, especially if they've been, if the, uh, you or the dough has been at it for a while, um, they can definitely dry out a little bit once their water's broken. Um, and then once you put, once you get the head diving position, you can pull. Um, but again, if you're having issues, you know, call a veterinarian out to help you. Um, if you want to maximize um, success in these situations, uh, you definitely want to call sooner rather than later. Um, something that, oh, go I'd ahead. Love, I'd like to, we, we have a question. Sure. Uh, is there a way to easily tell if the feet you see are front feet or back feet? Absolutely. Can, okay. Absolutely. Um, I was going to put that in here and I just didn't get to it. So let me see. Okay. So this picture is probably the most helpful. So the way to tell if they're front feet and back feet is um, you need to feel up. So here's the fetlock joint. Can you see my mouse moving, Rich? Yes, we can. Okay. So um, this is the fetlock joint. Okay. So there's two fat. Okay. There's each limb will have a fetlock joint and they all bend the same direction. But if you go up a joint, the carpus bends in this direction, in the same direction as the fetlock, okay? But the hocks bend in the opposite direction as the fetlock. Does that make sense? So you should be able to, don't feel just the fetlocks, you gotta feel uh, the carpus uh, up here, the knee joint versus the hock joint. And if the knee joint bends in the same direction as your fetlock joint, you have front legs. And if that second joint bends in the opposite direction, you have back legs. And that's a very important point um, because obviously, well, I say obviously, um, if you're going to pull a lamb or a kid, you want to be holding on to both front feet and not a front foot and a back foot because that won't work. Um, and even more importantly, is you want both front feet to be from the, on the same lamb or kid. So I have had people try to pull uh, lambs or kids and they had a foot from two different lambs. Um, so uh, you, again, it takes practice, um, but hopefully that little tip will help you determine which one's um, front and back legs. One of the tools that you might need um, are OB chains. Um, these are just sterile stainless steel chains uh, that you can use to um, wrap around a, a, a fetus leg and help hold it in position. So um, I don't need them as often in uh, sheep and goats as I do in cattle, for example, because if you push a calf back and it will get its legs stuck back in that giant uterus, uh, I don't have that big of an issue with sheep and goats. But it can be helpful uh, because usually everything is pretty slippery. And so the, what's great about the OB chains is they just have kind of a, um, like a little loop at the end that you slide through the chain, okay? And then um, when you're placing it on a leg, you wanna make sure to put your slip loop above the fetlock and then do kind of a half hitch below uh, the fetlock. And this is really going to reduce the incidence of leg fractures. Um, so that's just a smart way to do that to help prevent um, other <laughs> issues, sorry, with your, um, with your lambs and kids. Another tool you might need uh, or find useful is a head snare. Um, sometimes uh, when we have a head back, um, it can be helpful to snare the head essentially um, and guide it out. Um, other times I've found um, if the you or the dough is too small for my hand to fit in there and guide the head out with the, with the uh, lamb, I can put the head snare on the lamb and then guide it out with the head snare um, without having my hand in the birth canal. So this picture shows a lamb uh, with the head snare um, and it's basically, it depend, there's a couple different kinds you can get. This one looks like a, just a cable um, loop, uh, a slip loop that you fit over the head of the lamb behind the ears 
and then you tighten it up so that the handle of the head snare kind of goes in their mouth. And then you have a, you have a grippable handle uh, for that head and you can help guide that up and out through the birth canal. I have, oh, here's a better picture of it here. So um, this uh, yellow handle device is a head snare. It just has a loop of uh, plastic cable and that's gonna go around your head of your fetus. And then you're gonna cinch it down um, and put this part in their mouth. It's not gonna hurt them. Um, and that way you have a hold of that head. And then on the right side of your screen is the OB chains um, and then chain handles are helpful. Uh, although again, hopefully we're not putting a lot of force uh, when pulling these guys, um, they're not calves, <laughs> they're not cows. <laughs> um, so we do want to be gentle with that. So um, some of the essentials for your dystocia, lambing, kidding toolkit um, are going to be, well, warm water, which I guess you don't have to have there the entire time, but uh, clean breeding sleeves. So that's just something I would use to palpate or breed cows. Um, they go up to your shoulder. Um, you can have other gloves if you want, uh, but you definitely need the shoulder length gloves for sure. Uh, mild soap, such as Dawn dish soap, um, uh, OB lubricant, uh, which you should be able to pick up at any farm store, uh, prolapse retainers or harness, um, OB chains and handles. Um, I usually would have at least two of each of the chains and handles. So that way you can put a chain on each leg. Um, and then a head snare. That's my, that's my, minimum of what I would do for a, for a lamb and kidding toolkit. Uh, don't worry, we're going to get on, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to get to our uh, newborn toolkit as well, which is going to have more things. Uh, but this was kind of the dystocia, dystocia lamb and kidding part, K ah, kidding part. Sorry, it's getting late and I'm getting garbled. Okay. So as I mentioned before, if, if, if you have a, a malpresentation of the fetus, and you're not able to manipulate it, um, give up sooner rather than later. If, if it's been 15 minutes and you have made no progress, um, you're gonna need some help. And again, if you wanna maximize your outcome, best chances for a good outcome is if you call early. Um, because the longer you wait, the more likely that fetus will be to um, be dead uh, and the more likely your, um, you or doe will have um, infections and other issues. Um, severe discomfort is another reason to call a vet. Oops, sorry. Uh, severe discomfort. Um, if they're really carrying on while you're trying to manipulate things, uh, you need some help. You need some additional medications so that you can, A, make the manipulation easier, but also B, um, not stress out your lamb or, or your you and doe so much, um, you know, because it's painful um, to have to have kids and lambs and, and have someone up there uh, messing about. So, um, those are some of the um, most common reasons I would give a, give a vet a shot. All right, so let's talk about newborn care. Um, if everything is normal and the U has every, uh, everything, uh, has lambs and kids naturally, they should, be, um, they should be trying to stand within a few minutes of birth. The lambs are, tend to be a little bit slower, but um, really within the 30 minutes, um, they should be trying to stand. Um, and newborn, uh, excuse me, the, the mother should be cleaning them off actively um, when they're not actively pushing um, a new lamb or kid out. Um, nursing should uh, ideally occur within an hour of birth. Um, if you remember, uh, we talked about colostrum. We want to make the, sure those, that colostral antibodies are high uh, for our use and dose. Um, those antibodies are only absorbed in the newborn within 24 hours of birth. And honestly, you really want them to get enough colostrum um, within a couple hours um, because after they're born, the gut closes and it won't absorb any more antibodies. So it starts closing as soon as they're born and it becomes closed about 24 hours. So nursing should occur as soon as possible, um, the sooner the better. Um, because you want that colostrum in them. The other thing, um, particularly around here, which is central New York, we tend to have uh, very selenium deficient soil. Um, that might not be the case where you are. So I would definitely check with local veterinarians. Um, we're selenium deficient and we see a lot of selenium disease in our lambs and kids. So um, 
if you're in this area, uh, selenium injections are, um, are vital for our lambs and kids. It's basically as soon as they're born. Um, we need to uh, dip their navel in really strong iodine. So um, I think the number is 7% iodine tincture. Um, it may be harder to get a hold of now, but um, just the strongest iodine you can get. Okay. And so what that's going to do is that's going to prevent infections from traveling up the umbilical cord uh, while it's still wet and prevent umbilical abscesses um, and other infectious diseases. The other thing uh, that shouldn't be overlooked is you need to make sure the you or the doe has enough milk. So, and I don't, it doesn't matter if her udder looks great, you got to uh, milk her a little bit, make sure she has enough milk. Some, um, sometimes they uh, lamb or kid in and they have um, either mastitis or they have um, a dead uh, half of their udder, not dead, but um, definitely not milking. So that should always be checked. Um, Dr. Dutton? Yes. Doc, we have a couple of questions about sure. uh, selenium. Yep. Uh, so the first one is, do kids absorb selenium from their dams? Is it too much to give dam selenium and then also the kids? So it depends on how, it depends. Um, sorry, let me start out by saying uh, milk is very, a very poor vehicle for selenium. Okay. Um, it does have some, but relatively low. So you're not going to affect the kids if you give it uh, to the dam, unless uh, you do it during gestation which I don't really recommend because there are, um, there are warnings on the, the, the selenium injection boxes that they can cause um, abortion. So um, generally, if you're gonna supplement uh, does and use with selenium, I generally recommend to do it um, right before uh, breeding season. So um, the, next, yep. the next question we have is, do you use OCE and where is the best place for the injection? Um, so I do use BOCI. Um, I tend to do, uh, you can do selenium in the muscle or under the skin. Um, in general, uh, these guys are little, so I just do it uh, in the neck, uh, in front of the shoulder. Um, but you can give injections in the armpit too, where they have extra skin. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's just where your preference is. Um, I wouldn't be giving in, I wouldn't be giving injections in the hind legs, um, if anything. The next question related to selenium is how do you know if a kid or a lamb has selenium deficiency? Well, that's a good point. And I didn't um, add these pictures to my PowerPoint, but um, often a lamb or a kid won't show signs of selenium deficiency until a couple of days after birth. And then they can range from uh, mild symptoms such as dragging their limbs around or having trouble walking to really dramatic sudden death. Okay, so selenium deficiency basically causes um, uh, muscle issues. So um, I've seen some affected where they basically just couldn't use their hind limbs. They were just dragging them around. And I've seen, I've necropsied more than a few that just had sudden death because it does affect the heart muscle and they can have basically heart attacks and die. So um, that's, why, <laughs> that's why I usually just head it off by giving the selenium as soon as they're born. We do have a couple more questions related to this slide. Do yep. you recommend the use of navel cord clamps after treating with iodine? Um, not usually. No, I don't really think it's necessary. Um, unless there's some sort of bleeding issue, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be clamping them. The way the, um, the umbilical cord tears as the, um, as the lamb or kid is coming out, that's usually enough to snap those vessels back and not have a bleeding issue. So I wouldn't use a clamp. Um, I'd also be worried that if there was infection, you would just be trapping that infection inside. So I would just, I would just iodine treat them and be done with it. Another question. If we tube feed one to two ounces of colostrum, if we do not see the lamb nurse within 30 minutes of birth, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I like that. Um, so an ounce is about 30 mils. You should be feeding around 50 mils a kig. Um, so if you do two ounces, that's 60 mils. Yeah. 
I think that's fine. Um, and that's good that you're on top of it and making sure that they, making sure that they get that um, colostrum into them. So we're getting several questions in here, so a couple more. Do you recommend the mastitis vaccine? Uh, that would be herd specific, um, honestly, uh, because it really depends on whether your herd is affected or not. If you've never had a mastitis problem, I wouldn't bother. If you have had a mastitis problem and you're, um, are we talking about, let me guess, uh, we're talking about like the E. coli vaccine. Um, that would be a very specific type of mastitis. So um, not unless you're a herd that's been having issues with it. And then we have two more questions related to selenium that are related. Sure. Can you give too much selenium to a lamb or a kid? And what dose of selenium should you be giving newborn kids? So unfortunately, I can't give you the actual dose because um, you're not all my clients. I haven't seen your farm. Um, but yes, you can actually give too much selenium. So the best thing to do is to uh, have a relationship with your veterinarian and they will tell you the proper dose for them. It's not much, uh, but right, yeah, you can, you can overdose them. All right, so we're caught up on the questions. Thank All you. right, fantastic. Everybody has great questions and I know there's more I should have put into this presentation, um, but you know, you get busy and you, and you run around and <laughs> uh, we're covering a lot of good information. All right. Um, so one thing that is a good idea, and again, it depends on the size of your operation, um, it's to separate the dam and the newborns. Um, and so traditionally in sheep flocks, we do this in lambing jugs um, that are just small pens where we can put the ewe with her lambs and basically let them bond. Um, the problem, if they, if they all lamb and kid outside and there's a huge group, um, the lambs run around, they actually don't um, they actually kind of lose track of who their mom is if they haven't been allowed that time to bond and get to know each other. So, um, so ideally I would separate them, um, just for a day or two so that they can bond. And, um, we do see fewer, uh, rejections of lambs and kids this way. Um, so that's always a good idea depending on your setup. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about, um, the <laughs> six things that kill lambs and kids. <laughs> um, and you can see the first three things are hypothermia. Um, definitely uh, being cold is the number one killer. And uh, lambs and kids are traditionally born in, you know, February through, through April. And so that is, that's pretty cold. Um, so these guys really need a way to stay out of the cold. Um, obviously <laughs> you can knit colorful little sweaters for them. Um, that's a lot of work. Uh, we're going to talk about some other methods there. Um, the other things that kill them are hypoglycemia, okay, so low blood sugar, and that's usually caused by uh, a failure to nurse, okay, so they might fail to nurse because mom doesn't have milk, they might fail to nurse because they have some sort of issue like selenium deficiency, um, etc. There's a couple different issues. Um, selenium deficiency in this area is a pretty big killer of lambs and kids, and then infections. So infections, I just kind of lump them all together. Um, we can see things like joint ill, uh, where they have um, bacteria in the joints, they get swollen joints, um, they can get pneumonia, that kind of thing, diarrhea, a lot of different things. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm gonna have enough time to go into every little thing that they can get, but um, I just wanted you to be aware of some of these things. So, um, we a, yes. We have another question. Uh, what's your opinion about the use of oral drenches for lambs that contain vitamins and selenium? Uh, is it a good practice to administer a pump of the drench to each lamb to energize them after birth? Um, I think, again, it depends on your situation. It depends on your needs. So if you have uh, a selenium deficiency, I'm not sure how fast the selenium works going through the gut. Uh, versus giving it injectable. But if that's the only thing you have access to, I think I'd be fine with that. The only thing I would make sure of is that if you're going to drench each lamb, um, just make sure that your um, pump for your drench is nice and clean uh, because you don't want to get, um, you don't want to transmit, transmit bacteria between lambs and you don't want to um, give them, you know, something gunky that's had manure on it or something. So not always, not always necessary, but if, if that's what 
you have and that's working well for you, I would totally, I would totally do that. <clears throat> so um, in order to prevent hypothermia, uh, one of the things that um, obviously all our, our flock and our herd should have access to shelter, okay, a barn, um, somewhere where they can get out of the wind. But even with that, um, a lot of times our lambs and kids need a little extra help. So this is um, some images of, they've kind of made a little lamb or a kid heating uh, unit out of a, an old 55 gallon drum and they've put a, um, put a heat lamp in it. And so this, uh, both of these two drums have doors cut into them. Um, actually this blue one might be a little too big, but um, a small door so that lambs and kids can go in and out as needed and the adults can't go in there. Um, uh, there's a plenty of other ways to do that. I've seen, I've seen people make fences um, just like fence off a corner of the stall and do the same thing. Um, so it just makes a space for them uh, that'll stay quite a bit warmer than the outside air. Um, also making sure all of our lambs and kids are dried off really well. Uh, after they've been born is going to help them stay warm because if they're wet, um, that's, that's just no good. Um, and also having really dry bedding. Um, so either piling it up super high or changing it frequently um, is going to be important. Um, after, they, after they give birth, there's a lot of fluid that runs out. Um, so all that needs to be covered up and changed in, in order to keep your lambs and kids dry. Um, let's see. Um, so um, adequate colostrum intake is going to be key. So this is going to help prevent um, infections, future infections, um, and your and your uh, lamb or kid's well-being for weeks, for weeks beyond uh, being born. So um, you do, as I mentioned before, you want to evaluate your ewe or doe, uh, make sure they have adequate milk, um, and if you need to supplement colostrum, uh, you can do that. Uh, so somebody mentioned they give colostrum if they see they have a uh, nurse in 30 minutes, that's perfectly fine. Um, I wanted to make a note here that if you're going to supplement colostrum, make sure it's a colostrum replacer, not a supplement. So a colostrum replacer is used to, in place of the um, dough or use colostrum, uh, in case that dough, you know, passed away or she didn't have any milk or has bad mastitis. Um, the supplement is just supposed to be in addition to. So uh, I wouldn't even bother with a supplement. I would just get a replacer. So make sure it says that on the bag um, so you know what you're, you're feeding these guys. Um, and then the goal here is to get 50 milliliters per kilogram in the first two hours after birth um, and then feed some more over the course of the next day for a total of 200 mils per kg uh, in the first day is roughly what you're uh, aiming for. That would be ideal. We, we had another question come in about the, uh, the heating box of the previous slide. Uh, does the opening need to be big enough for the you uh, or the mother to get the head in? Um, I'm not sure that that's super important. I mean, I think as long as, um, but I think as long as the kid and the lamb can fit in there, the you should be able to get her head in. Um, but I'm not sure that that's super, super important. Uh, you want to make it big enough so that they can find it too. Um, sometimes they're a little dumb when they're born. So uh, you just got to be careful about that. But I don't know of any specific specifications. Um, I haven't built any heating boxes myself. So that's something you'd have to look up uh, to see. Okay, so sometimes we need to take lambs or kids uh, from the mothers and bottle feed them. And so um, often we do that if the lamb or the ewe or the doe has rejected their young, um, then they probably should be bottle fed. Although you might be able to graft them onto someone else. Um, you definitely should bottle feed if, um, if the ewe or the doe doesn't have enough milk. And um, sometimes when they have triplets or quads, you're gonna need to take one or two away um, so that they can adequately feed the ones that they have. Um, again, you can potentially graft some of these um, some of these <laughs> extra trip, uh, extra lambs or kids, uh, or if they've been rejected by their by their dam, you can graft them on sometimes um, if you put them in. 
real soon after the uh, the other uh, you or doe has has lamb. So um, that is a technique I haven't done a lot of. I just uh, so I don't have any specific tips for that, but um, you can definitely do that. All right, so here's my newborn toolkit. What you're really going to need. Um, and that is strong iodine, 7% tincture if you can get it, towels, uh, selenium, ideally the injectable selenium, um, but the, the oral stuff should, um, might work okay. Colostrum replacer, not supplement. Uh, milk replacer, um, if you're going to be bottle feeding them for a long time. Uh, small nipples are, and bottles. Um, I usually just use, I just get the small nipples uh, you know, from tractor supply and just use a, a, what is it? A 12, 16 ounce pot bottle, um, for them. Um, you may have to tube feed some of these guys. Um, some of you, it sounds like you're already doing that. That's fine. And, and if that's the case, you'll need a large feeding syringe and a, um, like a, I use a red rubber catheter for stomach tubing. Um, if you haven't stomach tubed, uh, lambs or kids before, I would recommend, uh, getting direction from, someone experienced or a veterinarian. Um, you just gotta be really careful. You don't put that tube into their lungs accidentally um, and drown them, that would be bad. Um, Cairo syrup, if you have a lamb or a kid that's having an issue with hypoglycemia, you can use Cairo syrup, um, rub it on their gums and that actually they'll absorb that glucose through their gums and you can give them a little boost that way. Um, and then of course the thermometer. Thermometer is gonna tell you if your lambs or kids are uh, hypothermic. Okay. If they're cold. Um, and obviously you can use it to, to measure fevers as well. Um, so do, yes, two please. more questions have come in. Uh, what are your thoughts on feeding whole cow, whole cow's milk instead of replacer? Um, I think it can be done. Um, I'm trying to think if I've read anything recently about that. Um, I think it certainly can be done. I think people do raise goats on that. Um, I wouldn't use it as a colostrum replacer. I, I would use a specific colostrum replacer, but you can feed them cow's milk and have them grow. Uh, so we that, have that's fine. A second question on what temperature uh, does your barn need to be to not have to use a heat lamp? Ooh, yikes. Um, you're probably looking at, um, trying to think what would be good at like 40 degrees, 45 degrees at least, um, before I wouldn't be worried about them. But if you're under 40 degrees, I would think you, you need something. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, for your newborns, uh, you should definitely call the vet um, if you have newborns who fail to get up, up to nurse uh, uh, so they can be evaluated on why that might be. Um, if you have a newborn that remains relatively unresponsive despite adequate warming, which again, hypothermia is our number one killer. So um, if, you get a, if you get a lamb or a kid, uh, maybe you weren't there and she had them and you don't know how long it's been, you know, they're still alive and they're cold. I mean, take them in the house. Put them in, um, put them in real warm water. Okay, not burning, but put them in, soak them in warm water, and get them, get that body temperature up, um, and see how they, see how they do. Um, if you're going to be tubing them with colostrum and they're really cold, you got to make sure that body temperature's up before you tube them, or, I mean, they won't be able to absorb it. Um, their actual gut barrier starts to break down when they're cold, so uh, make sure they're warm first before you tube them. Um, any any newborn that is not nursing, uh, lethargic, or has a fever of greater than 102 degrees, 2.5, sorry, 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or has diarrhea probably should be uh, evaluated by the vet to see what's going on. Um, they may need uh, additional treatments, antibiotics. Um, coccidia can be a real concern uh, when they're a little bit older, um, as well as um, a variety of bacteria causes um, scours. So. Those are some, some reasons to call it that. And, um, and then finally, um, some issues we see after they've lambed or kid. Um, all of these are issues that you probably should call the vet for. Um, and uh, we'll first talk about hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia is 
uh, a disease of low blood calcium, often from high milk production. So we see it a lot more commonly in dairy cows, but you, I've seen it in sheep and goats. So uh, it depends, it just depends on how much milk they're producing. So um, the symptoms uh, we see in the ewes and the does are, are weakness, uh, hypothermia, they'll often be a little, their temperature will be a little bit low. Um, they'll be recumbent. They'll have, uh, they might have an inability to rise uh, or difficulty rising. And in severe cases, we see seizures and death. Um, these guys really need intravenous calcium um, to, to get them uh, back on their feet. Um, and usually just one, uh, one or two treatments and they're pretty good. Uh, maybe with a, an oral calcium supplement. But once they're having trouble standing, um, you really need to get that calcium IV. Um, oral supplementation just isn't, isn't really going to be as effective. Uh, uterine prolapse, uh, not super common, but, you know, it, it is out there. Um, and this picture is uh, a sheep that's had a uterine prolapse. It's all this pink fleshy mass and uh, these big black spots are actually the, uh, the uterine, the used part of the placentome. So this is how the placenta attaches in ruminants. So these little, um, these little patches here. Um, and so uh, the prolapse, you know, a lot of times it's related to hypocalcemia, although sometimes we can get it with um, real difficult, you know, having a lot of trouble giving birth. Um, if the lambs or kids had to be pulled, um, sometimes there's just a lot of um, trauma and manipulation and they keep straining after they've had lambs and kids and they just strain and push it all out. Um, to treat it, we're going to have to push it back in after cleaning it, hopefully. Um, and then we need to treat that underlying condition. condition uh, like I said, is usually uh, hypocalcemia. Um, these guys have a high risk of hemorrhage uh, and death even after replacement. So um, sometimes the, the main uterine arteries come out uh, well, they will come out and sometimes they're ruptured and because they're out with this tissue and there's a lot of swelling, those arteries are compressed to some degree. And then once you replace the uterus, the arteries are not compressed anymore and they can bleed out. But, um, it's definitely something to call the vet right away. If you see something like this, uh, mastitis, super common, um, as we had talked about a little bit earlier, uh, mastitis, uh, really can progress quickly. So getting it uh, under control uh, as soon as possible is going to give you the best outcome. Um, generally mastitis, uh, sorry, is an infection and an inflammation of uh, the udder or the mammary gland. Um, symptoms include swollen, painful uh, mammary gland teats, uh, such as in this picture, we have swollen uh, mammary gland teat and it's turned purple, which is really bad. Um, Sometimes it won't be, this is one's pretty dramatic, of course. Um, sometimes it's just uh, the only symptom is kind of chunky milk, okay? So if you, if you milk out uh, one side of the udder, you might find some chunks in it. That's mastitis, even though it's not really serious, uh, or if that's the only sign. Um, and she might get over that herself. Uh, another sign of mastitis is hungry lambs and kids. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, having something like this is really incredibly painful. Um, and so she's not going to let those lambs or kids nurse. So if you notice the lambs are, are running around and they're, they're hungry and they're crying out and, you know, that's something that you better check mom and see if she's got um, an issue such as mastitis. We um, had a, another oop, question sorry. on yes. uh, hypocalcemia. Is hypocalcemia also called the milk fever? And it, if so, is there anything to do before kidding to prevent it? So milk fever is, uh, yes, that's the colloquial term for it. Um, you know, for sheep and goats, you know, it depends on your situation. So, um, so in cows, we generally try to prevent hypocalcemia uh, by feeding low calcium diets uh, before they give birth. So it depends on your nutrition program and how, what's, what your ability is to manipulate those um, feeds. So... Again, I don't see it super commonly, so I wouldn't do anything unless you're unless you're seeing a lot of it, um, and then uh, then you can do that. There are certainly calcium um, supplements, uh, oral gels, and things like that that you can give. Um, but again, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be bringing them up, stressing them out, and and 
uh, drenching them unless I needed to, um, because I don't want to cause potentially another issue. Um, so nutrition or, or drenching usually are your options uh, for preventing it um, before they kid. Um, and I think this is the last one, um, mutritis. So mutritis is an infection of the uterus, um, fairly common, um, usually associated with someone reaching in there and either not wearing gloves or not cleaning her up beforehand. So please try to do that to prevent this. So um, this picture is from a cow. This is pretty nasty mutritis that's coming out. Uh, this is uh, real red and chunky. And honestly, uh, mutritis smells so bad um, I can walk into a barn and <laughs> usually smell it. So um, just so you know, uterine discharge from a U or, uh, or a, a doe is normal for, you know, a couple of weeks after lamb air kidding. But as long as it's clear or white or not, whatever, not foul smelling, it's fine. It's when it's this copious amount of chunky stuff that smells horrific. That's when you have a problem. Okay, so they normally have some discharge. Um, sometimes they'll have discharge, but they won't act sick. Sometimes they'll be left lethargic. Sometimes they won't want to eat and sometimes and have a fever over 102.5. So it just depends. Um, if they have this, they're definitely going to need some antibiotics to get over it um, and have the best outcome for, for getting bred in the next season. Um, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so <laughs> are there... Um, all right. So there's plenty more things to cover. I'm sure there's things that I've missed. Um, so, uh, but I hope you got something out of this presentation and, uh, learned a little bit and, and, and I don't know, I was a pleasure to talk to you guys. So if you guys have more questions, uh, please, please feel free. Uh, feel free to put your, uh, any additional questions in the chat, or you can unmute, unmute yourself and ask your question directly of Dr. Dutton. We did get uh, several people saying thank you uh, for your presentation. Yes, you're very welcome. This was uh, fun for me to do. I'm sure I could have added to it, but uh, I hope I hope everybody learned something. Uh, excuse me. If I had um, a question for you, could I email it with a picture and ask you if your opinion on a prolapse I recently experienced that I lost the female and babies? Would that be okay if I could do that? Yeah, you could. I mean, uh, if I'm not your veterinarian, I can't give you advice legally, but um, but yeah, if you wanted to ask a question about it, that'd be fine. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be honest. My veterinarian didn't, when I called, didn't even want to deal with it. And oh. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a very good area of sheep vets. Um, and okay. the one sheep vet uh, was, she was unavailable. So uh, we tried doing the best we could. Uh, we were just wondering what, we, we still don't really know the ex, what it was exactly, if it was a uterine prolapse or we're not really sure. Okay, yeah, send me a picture. Are you, uh, where are you located? It, um, Western New York. Oh, okay, so far away from me, so I can't help, sorry. <laughs> But uh, it was something we had never experienced before. And we've had sheep for, you know, 20 plus years. It's just something new and we would like to learn from it. Uh, so we did, so we did take some pictures, mm -hmm. um, but I thought maybe if I could email them to you, you could just maybe even just an opinion. I, I understand you're not a vet that could give me, you know, that advice without being right there. Right. Right. So yeah, you can, you can email me at, um, guttenveterinary at gmail.com. Um, that's fine. That's my practice email. At email oh, right there. There's not any other questions. Uh, we thank you. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I have a doe. She had, or she was pregnant with trips the last time, and they were all turned backward, and I lost them all. Mm -hmm. What are the odds that that would happen again? So I think it's fairly likely that she'll have triplets again. I mean, some some does and ewes tend to throw the same number every year. Um, I 
don't know about the possibility of them all being turned backwards. You definitely can get tangled up in there. Um, so she'd be one, she'd be one that I would keep up close if you can and, and keep a close eye on her so that you can help out um, as soon as she starts going. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. We have a question here for the oops pregnancies where a doe or you was bred too young. What are the most important things to watch out for both during labor and things to help make it easier in the last trimester? So I, I wouldn't approach these necessarily any different, um, only, uh, or at least in the last trimester. Um, as far as during labor, um, again, these, I would watch these guys, um, uh, closely. And if you see them going into labor, I would jump in there and make, and see if the fetus is too big, because that's really going to be the biggest issue. If they're too young, you know, they're not going to have the, the pelvis big enough maybe to pass the lambs or kids out. So I would be checking that first thing. Um, and then if, if they're a candidate for a C-section, I'd be doing that sooner rather than later to, to optimize the out, the outcome. So, so we had someone make the comment, uh, that they had quint bucks Nubian by C-section, uh, and that they are fine. Uh, but they, she lost the mom three days later. Ah, just a, that's just a, a comment. That's a lot of babies and that's amazing. But C-sections are C-sections are hard. Um, if you, uh, if there's significant contamination, which happens, especially if they've been, if someone's been manipulating the babies for a little while, um, that, that contamination gets into the abdomen and, and then they don't do well. Um, so that's unfortunate, but that's an amazing amount of babies. <laughs> a couple more, uh, people saying thank you to, uh, your lovely presentation. All right. Thank you for all your great questions. It was a pleasure to speak to you tonight. All right. It doesn't look like there's any additional questions. So thank you everyone for tuning in and I wish you all a good night and I will be uh, ending the meeting now. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Rich.